Welcome to Governance Dialogues, uh, a program I have the pleasure to host on a weekly basis. My name is Elisa Cole, and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center, which is a think tank and advisory firm that works on advancing governance and strategy priorities worldwide, and in particular in emerging markets. And the, for those of you who have already had uh, the, the pleasure to dial into um, to these conversations, you would know that the program aims to essentially dissect and delve um, much further in the world of governance and economics and conversations with, with the world's uh, thought leaders um, from all, all over the world. And in past dialogues, we've had the opportunity to travel to Europe, to North America, the Middle East, and we'll be also um, exploring some topics in future episodes uh, on Latin America. Uh, and in particular on the Middle East, um, we've had a number of conversations with a range of speakers, some of them regulators. We've had a pleasure to speak to Brian Steyerwald, the CEO of uh, Dubai Financial Services uh, Authority. We've also spoken to some uh, prominent board members of uh, family companies like Michal Kanu, who's the chairman of Kanu Group, um, Rafat Malik uh, in Saudi Arabia, as well as Abdulaziz Ahlesi, who's a uh, CEO of uh, Gulf Bank, which is a Saudi um, Bahraini venture. And uh, with this tradition and sort of passion in the Middle East, which is a, a, also a longstanding passion of mine, a region where I've worked for more than 15 years uh, with regulators, but also uh, private companies and working on, on their governance frameworks, I would like to continue um, with this tradition uh, in today's uh, dialogue in conversation with Zulfika Radiali, who is joining us today from, uh, from the UAE to explore some of the new trends in, that are shaping the economies of the Middle East today and um, some of the governance implications and how they're playing out. And, and one of the particular reasons uh, I thought of inviting Zulfika today to this program is that his experience really spans not only the world of sort of, uh, con let's say conventional world of emerging markets, uh, you know, that was perhaps, uh, you know, in the past best referred to as the world of BRICS. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a term that was coined by a Goldman Sachs economist in um, early 2000 uh, to refer to sort of the rise of uh, a few powerful emerging market economies, which he predicted at the time would be dominating the world economy by 2050. And I think it's interesting that we're sitting here now in the context of sort of COVID, but also broader economic developments and asking ourselves whether that prediction uh, made uh, 20 years ago is, is still holding true. And I think part of our um, objective for this, uh, this week's conversation will be to delve in the world of emer emerging markets and explore which are the markets that are rising and how are these various emerging markets creating new economic opportunities um, between uh, the Middle East uh, and the world of uh, Asia uh, and, and, uh, and other emerging markets uh, where there are common interests and common synergies. So with that uh, slightly long introduction, Zulfika, welcome to Governance Dialogues. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Elise. I really appreciate your gesture of inviting me to your show, which I'm sure is uh, having a widespread audience across uh, the world. I feel honored that you give me this opportunity. Thank you so much. So it's, it's a pleasure to have you. And I would like to, I mean, I've heard obviously of uh, quite a number of your accomplishments, um, both in the public sector sphere and in the private sector. And this is actually part of the reason I thought your, your profile and your uh, track record is so interesting and relevant to this program. Um, but let me perhaps introduce you formally for our audience, um, so they have a little bit of background on, on, as to you know where you 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 sit or you stand um, uh, currently. So I know, I mean, one of the as I said, very interesting aspects of your work is that it spanned across a number of sectors. You've worked in investment, uh, real estate, hospitality, trading. Uh, both in the Middle East and uh, uh, India and, and other economies. Um, you've um, had a number of uh, multiple hats, uh, both as an entrepreneur, a social innovator, as I said, an investment uh, management professional, uh, where you are currently the director uh, of uh, directions investment under the chairmanship of His Highness uh, Zayed bin Zayed, um, uh, um, bin Zayed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, uh, and also you are the director of uh, New York-based boutique investment firm uh, First Wall Street Capital, which has about 30 years of experience and has done about um, I think 30 billion dollars of deals. I know you're also involved in the um, entertainment sector, notably in the film and entertainment production. Uh, with the company called uh, Cinemois, but also um, in, in Los Angeles, but also in Canada, 
um, as well as other sectors that are completely unrelated, um, such as um, uh, you know your work on on um, uh, uh, bit in the Bitcoin uh, in, in the artificial intelligence space, uh, and also on different political initiatives and um, um, positions in logistics, airspace, and defense sectors. So. Perhaps I'll stop there because the, the list of your accomplishments is actually quite, uh, quite long. So um, with that in mind, I mean, I think an obvious question that, that comes to mind is around your experience in boards, because obviously you've sat on boards uh, across, uh, across the world. And uh, what's interesting, you've sat on boards where you've had to reconcile public interests with uh, private shareholder interests. You've had to reconcile interests of uh, Middle Eastern investors with Western or, uh, uh, you know, Indian investors. And I would like to ask you, um, what in your view were perhaps the most important challenges in doing so? Um, and what truly made those boards that uh, succeeded in, in this international context successful? Sure. Thank you for the question. It's a pretty tricky question. It can take a full one hour for me to explain you the human mindset and behavioral uh, science behind it. But at the end of the day, I think uh, one common factor that binds all of us is, uh, well, I would say money, but besides money is the greater good that we can do for the world. And um, I think uh, everybody's aligned to the concept. So when we set up a investment portfolio or investment target, it's basically coming together of the like-minded individuals who believe in that idea, who believe in that particular sector or that particular uh, concept you know so there's always that first me meeting of minds you know what we call moms you know? meeting of minds is very important so mm -hmm. we have those moms in place uh, very early in the business and then you know we set up our process and job descriptions in such a way and we set our sops in the fund or when we are doing direct deals as well we set up ourselves in a way where it's all automated process where there's very little room for uh, human emotions whatsoever, positive or negative, doesn't matter. Um, there is no emotional call, you know. Oh, just because I like the Lakers, I'm gonna go invest with them, or just because I feel uh, Manchester United is a good deal, I should go and do it. No, there has to be a rationale. There has to be a complete justification and everything should make sense on the business model. So it's all very automated in itself, you know. I, I On the other side, I feel that the reason why most of the family office especially fails is because there's too much of emotions, too much of family drama that goes into it, you know? So I, in fact, uh, teach and mentor a lot of family offices, a lot of these upcoming entrepreneurs who are from a legacy and who holds a uh, family name behind them. So I, I tell them always like, you know, set up a vision, you know, decide what you want to do, where you want to invest. You can fight on that, not after making an investment because that will be detrimental to your investment and that's not good for your overall portfolio. That's but fight as much as you want before, you know, and, but, but once you come together on a certain conclusion, then stick to it and uh, set up the process basically in a, such a way, use uh, internet, use digital platforms, ERP solutions, use as many, you know, digital avenues, uh, you know, that you can to create uniformity in, uh, in uh, the overall conduct of business, you know, but I think that's the right way to do it. And otherwise, like I said, um, there's never a situation which you cannot solve by just going out for a drink or going to play a golf, you know? So there's uh, issues that can always be ironed out. It's all humans at the end of the day, so. I yeah. like the acronym though, the MOM, uh, because in a way MOM then replaces MOUs, no? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I always believe in meeting of minds. I'm, I'm like a people's person and I always believe, you know, MOU is just a piece of paper. If you do not have meeting of minds, it's of no use. It's of no use, absolutely. Let me ask you a question uh, because you mentioned uh, around sort of collaboration between also emerging collaboration between uh, UAE, Israel, and you're also obviously working with, with other markets. How is that collaboration sort of penning up in reality? And are we seeing already some real fruits? Because obviously there's a lot of discussion uh, from political angles, but you know, on the ground, is there um, impact that, that are, is, is being created on the ground from perspective on foster entrepreneurship? Uh, um, beyond sort of the, the talk that you hear in, in the papers? Yeah, so, I mean, I would say that uh, this is uh, not a big deal. I mean, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, the portfolio that you carry, you know, is just about uh, rejuggling and deciding and making a conscious decision because 
um, some of the matured markets do not give you the kind of results or the returns that you expect. You know, so you have to take some risks in the emerging markets where the growth is very high. But again, like uh, even in the emerging markets, we're seeing trends where there are very secured and very sophisticated deal flow that is coming on the way. I mean, right. if I talk about a deal flow coming out of uh, India right now, a deal flow coming out of uh, Vietnam, deal flow coming out of Philippines, you know, um, some some deals coming out of Brazil. Um, we are looking at some transactions coming out of uh, Mexico, um, and also in Europe. I mean, you know, there are some emerging markets that we are interested in and looking at, and there are some really sophisticated deal flows and the valuations are uh, now at a very good pricing. You know, they have all learned their lessons. So the whole uh, bubble has bursted now and there is a, a meeting of mind, there's the correct valuations in place. So it makes sense to you know, divide your portfolio in a sense where uh, you create a diversified um, sectoral as well as regional allocations. So <clears throat> we have done that and um, we stick to that. But like I said, uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. We allocate, yes, but we are quick enough to learn. It, it, it's not like a train that once it started, it's only gonna stop at the designated stations. You know. Mm -hmm. We are like a Rolls Royce, you know, we stop whenever we want, we drive at our speed and we take a break when we want to take a break. So it's more like a very legacy kind of a business model that we follow. So we rejuggle ourselves, we take our seat back, sometimes we take our foot back and evaluate ourselves. But it's, 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 it's happening very well, the transition is going very well for us. And like I said, I'm more a fan of uh, the tech across sectors, you know, because tech is like, like, uh, like I'll be honest to you. You can't go to oil and gas uh, big biggies like Adnox and Aramco's of the world and Shells of the world and teach them how to explore oil that they know better than all of us. But there are processes in oil and gas which can be digitized using artificial intelligence and different types of uh, you know, digital tools that can help them streamline their processes, avoid hazards and accidents. You know? So these are called next practices. Yes. And we, so we spoke we, about that last time we spoke about sort of the, the sort of the new uh, the, the new uh, sort of tech ideas that you're bringing to disrupt, uh, con let's say, conventional uh, sectors. But I want to ask you actually a question around startups uh, more generally. I mean, I know you've been involved in, in you know, uh, basically uh, kicking off a number of startups in the, in the tech and, and other spaces. And it's an interesting story because in the Middle East, as we all know, um, there's been a lot of talk about tech startups and regulatory sandboxes and regulators and stock exchanges have struggled to get, um, you know, uh, tech companies or startups more generally to list. And there are some examples. I mean, there was a, an interesting story that came out recently, as you know, uh, with the first ever, I think, listing of an Arab um, company, tech company on Nasdaq, um, uh, Angani. And uh, more generally, I want to ask you whether you think there is sort of still reason to think that capital markets are the place for startups to get funding, in particular in regions where you sit, where, you know, there are, let's face it, uh, equity regions and where capital markets have been more, let's say, more marginal to the game that they have been, for example, in the US. Is there kind of a future in your world to, you know, new tech listings and tech hype around, um, you know, listing of, of, of these companies, or is that sort of overplayed? Um, there are three pronged uh, ideas and, and strategy to any kind of fundraising. More, first and foremost is the access that you have, the kind of money you have access to, you know? So sometimes some folks uh, will have access more to institutional capital, you know, which will want a much more highly regulated environment. They would want various securities. They would want uh, much more transparency. While you may have some people have access to a lot of family offices and uh, private money. So depending on the quality and the type of money that you have access to, that is one consideration. Secondly, it's about which region you see your growth potential, you know. Do you see yourself growing more in the North American market or do you see yourself growing more in the very specific Middle Eastern market? So depending on that. And then third consideration is uh, personal uh, emotions, personal egos sometimes, you know, mm. of promoters. Like some promoters, they don't need to be listed, but sometimes they just feel, oh, listing themselves or um, um, putting themselves on the bourses will definitely boost their image or make them look more cleaner shop for further future investments. You know, so it's all about uh, how you see your own business. You know, so it's a lot of aspects like uh, involved to it. For me, um, real estate is definitely a big no-no for us to go public markets because 
real estate is a very cyclical business i cannot give you every quarter the same results you know sometimes there's a, a problems with the approval sometimes there's a problem with the construction phases sometimes there's a problem with um, the market dynamics sometimes your financing becomes an issue you know so you cannot be going the way you planned that five year or a 10 year project you know in mm-hmm. a five year or a 10 year you'll see perhaps three or four cycles in the real estate that's my experience so far so going for an ipo or going public uh, with a real estate company or an infrastructure company is a big no 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 it just uh, puts you at the hands of uh, had some problems I mean, as we know with with a lot of the real estate companies in the region like you know i mean there's i, Arfad, there's... I don't want to name them i would not name them but uh, no. we all know what happens but on the other hand if i am a if i am a tech company if i am a, a company which has got a fmcg product you know um there i don't have a problem because if my product clicks it will give me a growth and it will be a steady growth you know so that will impress any investor to come on board but for me the most important reason why i would go public will be to take my let's say we have some of the mining assets which we took uh, to the bourses uh, back in a day was because we had a mines in place we had set up the mines we had long term concession on the land from the government of that particular country and we had a long term off take agreement so it's all sacrosanct it's all stacks up to any investor it's a no brainer you know yeah. you've got a resource you've got a mine fully operational and developed and then you've got a buyer long term a blue chip company with a amazing balance sheet and a network it's a no brainer for any investor that kind of deal with a set returns is perfect for public markets but um i will be very cautious if it is a startup if it is a company at a late stage capital uh, fundraise uh, i would restrict myself to go straight into the public markets or an ipo perhaps i will explore more on the spac side i know that's one of your important question exactly <laughs> but, i mean yeah. i think it's interesting when we think about listings i mean because there is a lot, little bit of a um, i'd say a dichotomy between what's going on in the regulator's mindset and what's going on perhaps in the entrepreneurial mindset and in that we've seen continued obviously efforts on on the side of the bourses to bring with the, the likes of the normal listing segment for example in Saudi Arabia and other segments that were particularly uh, aimed to target to bring kind of more innovative or um, uh, firms to public market uh, and those efforts have been moderately successful i'd say pretty much uh, a little bit more successful in Saudi than other markets where where regulators have really uh, struggled And so my next question is really um you you put your your finger on the spot is around SPACs and and the spike in in kind of uh their creation but also you know coming back to the the core of our of our, our conversation is whether you have is, of course would like to hear your thoughts as to whether you're concerned with um the governance uh, implications of these types of listings um and more generally do you think that SPACs is a true sort of um transform structural transformation in the capital markets as we've seen for example with the ETFs or high frequency trading that have fundamentally changed the nature of uh trading in public markets yeah sure so i i i don't see any reason why there should be any backlash from the regulators or from investors be it institutional or private when it comes to spac because um spacs are actually a very good way given the volatility in the market right now given the kind of uh, economic downturn and the economic uncertainty companies and uh, bourses and uh, geographies and uh, economies are facing today um i think uh, it's going to be very risky proposition to go out and list um, yourself in a, doing an ipo especially currently in the us or on um, nasdaq or nyc or footsie wherever you go um i i would be very concerned if i had to go do an ipo at the moment you know because if something goes wrong which chances are very high of things falling apart and you as a corp as an entrepreneur as a as an inventor or as a promoter you stand to lose a lot more than gain you know from these uh, highly volatile marketplace at the moment so <clears throat> in my mind in in my mind uh, I I still prefer going SPAC because uh, SPAC already has um, money in place and uh, if uh, there is already a funds in place then it excites and it is uh, very much an interesting proposition for a promoter to go access that money because at least that money is committed you know that that money is there 
you know and of course yes you can always say that there is always a fixing there is always a, a component of insider trading and all that but but i believe that there are genuine situations as well there are a few who might be doing that which i don't know but uh, i believe that overall in general there are some real genuine deals um there are some spacs which are already flushed with uh, billions and billions of dollars and they have their targets now and i think those spacs uh, will have to return their monies very soon because they all lost the last whole year due to the pandemic so they have a situation where in next 6 to 9 months they will have to return the capital back to the investors so this is a very good situation very ideal situation for promoter across uh, genre across sector to kind of consider you know going via spac to the public and then if the markets are better ones yes you can consider doing that but i would i would want a long term steady investor with me instead instead of uh, a highly transitional or a very cardinal markets where uh, you know the prices and uh, the situation is completely out of your control because yes. you are at the stage where you're growing you're coming up you don't want to have a pressure from regulator all the time you don't want to have a pressure from the public from um, all sort of detractors because it's very easy to manipulate things on the public markets you know i would always want to access quality capital long term capital if it is an institutional long term like pension funds like the sovereigns they all like to go long term they want to take a long term calls they don't want very uh, aggressive returns they want very basic but very short short return you know and that i think is the right model for me that's that's why i started even my investment philosophy revolves around that you know Hmm. I don't want those uh, astronomical numbers, you know. I don't want those. When a promoter tells me there is a twenty percent IRR, thirty percent IRR, I'm like, you know what? All the upside is yours. Just guarantee my eighteen percent if you're so confident. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> but but you you speak about um, sovereign investment, and obviously, given your your role uh, with the with the holding in in the Abu Dhabi, but also other um, projects you you you've been involved in, you obviously have this. Uh, have seen uh, deals structured whereby uh, sovereign money um and, and royal family money is tied in with with other private investors and you know there is also kind of i think a trend and tell me how you feel about it but my feeling is that there's a trend in the region where um you know i hear comments from from some family offices in for example in saudi arabia who say well you know we're kind of going Uh, "Quote unquote Korean style" in a sense that uh, the, the uh, sovereign fund is encouraging us to co-invest and and you know work together um, in the name of sort of big picture projects, uh, domestic development projects. What's your view on 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 this sort of um, co-investment uh, strategy and and what experience have we seen so far in terms of kind of private public uh, investment as far as uh, well at least the, the Gulf is concerned. yeah my my thought process is reverse on that i usually don't chase uh, the large sovereigns and um, the so called pension funds i usually don't like to align myself with them because like i said they have a fixed strategy they have a, a certain time frame in which they need to return their capital you know so these are some of the challenges which i don't like like i told you i like to be a rolls royce and uh, i like to stop when i want to stop i want to take my break when i want to take the break i'm not like a public transportation you know where i have to stop at the fixed destination <laughs> so i still don't like that way you know where i chase the sovereign or the sovereign wants me to come along and also another challenge is that sovereign can write a billion dollar check very happily while my total portfolio for that particular year might be a billion dollar so i definitely cannot match the size that they are and uh, mostly when a major major investor comes in they usually take a tag along rights and drag along rights with them <clears throat> you know so if they want to exit you have to exit along with them if there is an investor who wants a 55% of the company and if the sovereign has 50% they will drag your 5% with them you know to exit so i really don't like those uh, tough conditionalities and uh, situations which are out of my control you know so unless something which is um, a really a blue chip really really high end uh, uh, issue where um, even a percentage or a two will make me happy which will help me look like a great portfolio at the end of the day that is one of conditions one of situations i might consider but not like a general trend i will not want to follow that trend where you know i mean it, at least i would say um it is still another 3 4 5 years away that maturity that coordination that understanding still has to develop and most importantly the family offices have to structure themselves 
to be able to match up with the professional setups of the sovereign wealth funds and all. Of so course. I kind of don't uh, want to go chasing unless my shop is ready for that. You know? oh, of course, you're, you're right. And, and also, I mean, you, we know that there is a few companies in the Gulf that have that structure of, in terms of family offices, like the Oleans that are more, let's say, governance ready or a few others, but not, not all of them. And then you also... Well, there, are some, there are some large family offices and we call ourselves also one of the largest ones. So yes, we do follow the sovereign, but we don't necessarily do those transactions where the sovereign goes. For example, if the sovereign identifies that uh, going into big bang fintech in India is a great idea. So I won't go to the number one big player and uh, fight with him for a 2% stake for a billion dollar. I would rather go to the number two and the number three because the size of the market is so huge. There is room for the number two, number three, and the number four as well. Mm. You know, I might as well go to the second guy and control 50% of that company and rather bring it to the level of the number one with our efficient management and our connections and our relationships which is not just business, but also diplomatic in nature, you know, mm -hmm. and bring it to the level of the number one and take the upside along with me, you know, and then encourage the sovereign to come along with us. Perhaps. It's an interesting approach. I mean, I've heard uh, actually different echoes. I mean, as I said, you know, some, some are wondering, some family offices are wondering where it, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting idea or not. So it's, 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 a, it's definitely interesting to hear your views and, um, and I, I, I understand. Well, your you know why Indian CEOs are more in demand now, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And but, but I'll tell you honestly speaking, but uh, I only work in the markets where I have a full control. Like I told you, I'm a student. Yeah, I understood out. that you, you like to, to know where you're getting into and to be able to pedal. I am a group of fan. I'm not a fan of SWOT analysis and all those fancy analysis. I'm a fan of only one thing, which is PESTEL, which is politics, you know, economics, social stakeholders, technology, legal and environment. I just look at these aspects. But mm -hmm. first, first and foremost, important is political environment. Do I have an understanding or a right sync with the politics of the country? Because every time there is a challenge to a politician, the first thing he wants to do is take care of everything or screw up everything that was someone else's initiative. Yes. You know? So I always make sure that uh, you know, I'm always on the right side of the politics in every market I go. And I ring fence my investments in the best possible ways I can. And uh, Given all of these aspects, look, I can't control what happens when the product is launched, when it goes into the store, or when it goes to the marketplace. That I can't control. But I know what the market wants. And the market wants discounts. The market wants good product, good service. And if you have all of these things in place, then the only thing that can put you in trouble is the pestle. You just have to ensure pestle is in place. That's something you can control. No, it's true. <clears throat> It's true. I mean, um, just in the interest of time, I think it's a fascinating conversation that we're having. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we have a promise. I have made a promise to keep them for half an hour or so. So, um, I mean, uh, perhaps one last very sort of um, bird eye view quick question. It seems to me that from a lot of the so a number of your remarks point to, you know, this kind of growing um, let's say linkages between various emerging markets, also, you know, growing investment. We know there's been um, like quite a number of investments from by sovereign funds and family offices into, you know, um, Europe, for example, in the back of cheap valuations. Um, so I guess my very last question um, uh, is, is whether you think that will have a lasting impact on corporate boards, meaning that, you know, you might have, you see, for example, more representation uh, on boards of European companies, of Middle Eastern investors, or do you see this kind of sort of long-term trends setting in, or is it too early to tell? Well, in your one question, there were three questions. So of course. The last question. Oh, <laughs> it's questions built in that. But uh, to answer uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a way which is uh, quick and uh, more uh, methodical, uh, like I said, I mean, uh, you know, there is no set format. There is no set formula to any success, any business model, or uh, it's all about uh, the people, politics, and uh, the overall atmosphere in terms of uh, where you're entering. Europe has always been a first choice because of the stability it provided, but uh, it did not uh, take care of your uh, returns, you know? So you yeah. have to go into the markets which will give you the returns. It may present certain challenges, that's why I said, the pestle, that's where it comes in the picture. So, you know, you ring fence yourself as best you can. Um, the, the boards, as you talked about today, like I see, there's a lot of diversity coming in. There's a lot of uh, newer breeds that are coming in. Um, but 
when i see a middle eastern fund manager or an indian fund manager it doesn't mean he is an indian or he brings in that indian mindset perhaps he is educated and brought up abroad you know and uh, he is fully an american in his style of operation you know like i was dealing once with a korean uh, fund manager with me i won't call him a fund manager he was an investor basically yeah, but his entire approach was very very much uh, you know american in style because he passed out out of uh, the water so so i mean you know there are these uh, uh, paradigm shift that we are seeing in management styles in uh, approach towards uh, how you want to conduct your businesses but all across genre across the region across the world uh, tech is playing an important role more and more people want to have those algorithms and have those models in place which helps them uh, come up with um, you know a conclusion on as to what they should do next you know so yeah. more and more people are resorting to that and that's where you know a fund manager needs to be scientifically and uh, technologically efficient as well you know he should be able to read through the excel sheets he should be able to identify the the challenges and the loopholes he should be smart enough to read the footnotes because everything looks uh, glossy nice but there's always a, a secret recipe or secret sauce in the footnotes you know he should be smart enough to read between the lines and the footnotes i always tell people um i think it's a combination of a lot of aspects that actually makes you successful you know like when i entered middle east people thought okay an indian guy with an american qualification how successful he's going to be with the middle eastern conservative mindset but again as a trained person in um, business all i had to do was align myself culturally the culture in middle east is not uh, uh, of a uh, just a typical investor but it's a trading mindset you know it's a mindset which revolves around touch feel and uh, having that kind of a comfort with the person and the trade you know Absolutely. so yeah so i brought in all these uh, aspects understanding for me most important is the understanding of the person you know the cultural capital that goes behind is intellectual capital capital so that's what i do and uh, i think it's going so far so good and like i said every deal has its own uh, unique uh, preposition you have to go with that so no, i hope i've answered your question in multiple ways that i tried to <laughs> yes well i think it's 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 been interesting it's been an interesting conversation because we kind of asked the the the, the corporate the corporate structure culture side of things the structure of the boards and also the the changing political uh, the, the shifting sands the changing political dimensions and how that's you know fast creating uh you know perhaps new environments or new relationships between um different emerging markets that we you know as i mentioned at the beginning of this conversation perhaps we wouldn't have thought of 20 years ago and how bricks might not be looking as it did 20 years ago and and uh it's really been interesting to hear from you on on the you know both public markets developments and also uh private developments and hear a little bit of an insider perspective of how decisions and investments are made and what governance um plays um how governance plays or, or not uh, a role in in these decisions so i would like to to thank you um as ofika very much for for joining us from um from the uae and uh we hope to have uh, another chance to to see you on the program thank you so much for having me and uh the questions were uh, trying to get me controversial but i controlled myself but uh, thank you thank you for having me here really appreciate it Thank you Zofika and for those of you who are joining us and who joined us in the past um you will um you know you you would know that all the episodes of governance dialogues are available uh gratis on our on our YouTube channel and uh for those of you who are new to the program we do encourage you to subscribe to our channel um through a link that's available at the bottom of this video and um uh, to uh, to tune in to uh conversations on on various uh, governance priorities thank you for joining and uh look forward to uh, seeing you on future episodes of the program. Mm -hmm.